to our lives for Jesus' sake. Amen. Okay. Yes, today is Pentecost. Now, we will finish Galatians today. So, Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 9. Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 9. All right, I'll read verse 9 and 10. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. All right, there are a couple of things happening here in Paul's overall discussion in Galatians that kind of tie into what he's saying here. Um, one, and the main point, and we've been hammering on the whole time, is Paul facing down the Judaizers, who were legalists, who were teaching people that you had to be circumcised if you want to get to heaven. And that was just a symptom of a greater problem which was their teaching that you have to follow the law if you want to get to heaven. That the law is what justifies you before God. So circumcision was an example of that law. The other issue that Paul at the end of Galatians takes up is the issue of the, this was an accusation by these Judaizers against Paul. And that he was eliminating the law and therefore people were going to fall into chaos, nobody was going to do what God wanted, everybody was going to be sinning openly and grievously and thinking nothing about doing good. And that's always what legalists worry about. If you don't focus on the law, it's going to be chaos, and everybody's going to do what they want to do. Uh, and that's still how legalists think. Paul counters that at the end of Galatians here. The law is not what makes us righteous and produces goodness. The gospel does that. Uh, as Christians, as, as sinners, we of course still need law in our lives. But as Christians, it is not the law that drives us, it's the gospel. So here, in these verses, Paul takes up the discussion of doing good. And he, and he has for the last few verses now. In answer to those who say that you Christians don't care anymore about doing anything good in the eyes of God because you're not focused on his law. Paul tells people, no, do good. Don't get weary of doing good. Keep doing good. You know, goodness matters. Our lives, how we conduct ourselves matters. It just doesn't save us. That's the, that's the dividing line that people weren't getting. So here, let us not grow weary while doing good. So keep it up. Uh, in due season, you'll reap if you don't lose heart. As you have opportunity, do good to all, especially those who are the household of faith. So this is the answer to the claim of the Judaizers that Christians don't care about doing God's will anymore. Uh, now to pick the, pick the words apart a little bit. Uh, to do good. The word do in Greek can also mean to make or work. So work good. Good also can mean noble, honorable. So basically just do the right things by God. You know, follow his word. And don't grow weary while doing it. Uh, doing good also, the question there, what does it mean for a Christian to do good? That's the law, actually. You want to do good? Follow the commandments. God's pleased when we follow his commandments in faith. Not when we follow his commandments thinking we're earning his love, but when we follow the commandments as an expression of thanks for what he's first given us. That pleases God. And that's what a good work is. How do you do a good work to your neighbor? Support him in every bodily need. Don't kill him. Don't slander him. Don't steal from him. Don't commit adultery. You know, that's, that's how you practice good for your neighbor. Both the negative, don't do, and the positive, this do instead. Uh, Paul had, in the previous verses, also talked about sowing the Spirit and walking in the Spirit. That's his way of talking about the gifts of the Spirit, faith. So doing good is living out your faith. It's that simple. Uh, faith isn't just a thing to know in your heart. Faith is, is life. 
tell the confirmands that all the time too. You know, you sit in confirmation, you have to learn a bunch of memory work. You have to go through the different six main parts of Luther's small catechism and learn all that stuff. But this really isn't about learning stuff up here. This is supposed to be the shape of your life from this point on. You know, this is how you live a life, not just new thoughts to have. And that's what Paul's driving at. All right, in due season, it says in verse 9, do good for in due season we will reap if we don't lose heart. Verse 10 says, as we have opportunity, let us do good. This is, you know, this is, this is the weirdness of translation. That in due season and that have opportunity are actually exactly the same word in Greek. They're just translated different ways in the English. But it's exactly the same mean, uh, word meaning time, really. The, it's the word for time, kairos. Uh, so at the right time, you'll reap. And therefore, at the right time, do good to all. So does this suggest there are times, in fact, when we don't have to do good? What is the proper time for doing good or acting in faith? It is. Therefore, at the right time, or as you have opportunity, let us do good. So what's the right time for doing good? Always. Always. But the, the thing about doing good is that it looks different in different circumstances and at different times. That's right. And sometimes doing good for Jesus meant chastising people. And sometimes doing good, as Jesus did, meant helping people physically. And other times it meant um, speaking to them. Or ex for some, he had to expose their sin and hurt their feelings. So doing good doesn't always feel good to the one receiving it. But it is always being right by God and truthful to God's word. So you've got a couple of passages here, like Jude if you look in Jude, there's only one chapter in Jude. Verses 23, 22 and 23 as an example. Right before Revelation. 22 and 23. And on some have compassion, making a distinction. But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. So good, in some circumstances, means having compassion. Good, doing good in other circumstances, means making them afraid. You know, save with fear. Point out to them how serious their circumstances are and the fact that they may very well go to hell if they die at this point in time. Hating even the fire, even the, even the garment defiled by the flesh. So uh, pulling them out of the fire. Hardest part to do because as parents, I'm, I let Chester be all this part. <laughs> because it's just, you're so afraid of using, losing a relationship with your child because they're so adamant about how they see. They take pieces of the Bible. God loves everybody. Right. You know, and of course He does. That doesn't mean that He um, approves of the way they live. Right. And just as hard as it is for us to change the things about ourselves, and if, and if, we're, and if we keep doing it by our way, our will, we're never going to do it. And we have to lay it all down, and it's the hardest thing we've ever done. It is. But as soon as we start doing it by his will, then all his promises start coming true. And it's the most wonderful experience. But they are so adamant about what they believe. And their father has to be so adamant about what they are not believing. That's mm -hmm. right. And it causes friction. Sure. It's easier for him to deal with it than me because mama's always been one to scoop him up and love him through. Dad, he's always been one that they've had a, a resurrection, residential fear for, but yet they adore him. So it's easier for, them, for him. I, I hate to make him the guy that has to do it, but every time we see our children, he has this conversation with them, and they get so mad. 
Yeah. It's just our oldest daughter. Yeah. It's yeah. not our. It's not our youngest daughter. Our youngest daughter comes here. Mm -hmm. She. She gets it. Right. Yeah. Parenting that way is hard, and it you know not just parenting, but friendships and every other relationship you have. Um, being a Christian does not mean affirming people where they are. It means speaking truth. But you can do it lovingly and compassionately as much as possible. But there does come a time when being loving and compassionate to them is going to sound like you're being mean. Every time. And that's just the nature of it and it's exactly what Paul is talking about when he says at the right time or under the right circumstances, you know, do good by God. The other day we had a conversation with him and and at first it didn't go well. But he stuck by his principles and eventually she what happened with the car. But he, yeah. he stuck with his principles and I'm and I stuck with mine and eventually she ended up doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And but it was a fight. Yeah. She went into college as a very conservative young lady. Yeah. And when she got out she was as liberal as I know I Colleges, yeah. I wish she hadn't even gone. Universities are not good places for souls. Because this, the, the stuff that she has now is supposed to be an idea of what m makes her who she is instead mm -hmm. of what she had before she <clears throat> went, which is the character that, that, that she lived by of God, who's given it to her by all the things she's seen happen with all of her family members in times of trials. All right. Yeah, the devil gets a hold of them in, in school, but they can, they can be brought back. It's just hard work. The other thing that uh, when, when uh, Galatians here talks about the right moment, the other thing it reminds us of is the fact that these right moments are provided by God. We don't necessarily get to pick and choose when these good things we're supposed to do happens. God's the one who drops them on our lap and we're to act you know, at the proper time as it's there in front of us. Carpe diem, not, not a putting off until it's more convenient for us. Uh, also a reminder, reaping at the proper time, verse 9. Um, let's see, for in, in the proper time, in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Um, understand that reaping business does not necessarily mean we're always going to get to see the reward or benefit of doing good. We may not see anything positive happening from our perspective, but that doesn't mean God isn't working for good, and it doesn't mean that there might not be you know, eternal blessings someday for that person that we're not going to see on our side, on this side of heaven. In the box on the handout, uh, I thought this was a good comment by this uh, commentator named Das. Paul strikes a somber note in the condition he expresses on reaping, if we do not give up. Individuals may become discouraged when they find themselves struggling against many of the same problems over and over again. They may grow weary. Reaping fruit is not automatic. A real danger exists that believers in Christ may apostatize, that is, leave the faith, falling away from the faith, and miss out on eternal life. The cosmic power of the flesh remains steadfast in its assaults. So yeah, don't grow weary because you're going to be tempted to give up. The devil is going to try and make you think things are a waste of time. of your will and not his. And when you fall away that way, sometimes think, you think you, you have this big ego and you think that, you know, I have this degree and I have this, or I have this experience and I have this big ego and this is what I do. My job is make me, makes me who I am. Before you know it, you're putting it before your own family, your own children, you're trying to save and help other people and then it becomes so much on your plate that you end up falling back into old habits before you ever had God, who is supposedly the one you started doing this for in the first, first place. Yeah, you can't do good like he wants if you can't take care of yourself either. So that's part of it. Self-help as well, yeah. All right, now let us do good to all, especially those who are of the household of faith. So there is a priority in our good works. We are to take care of each other 
you know, especially the world is, after all, united against us. But we as Christians need to be actively supporting each other in the face of the world's attacks. But this does not mean that we should ignore the needs of non-Christians. Uh, in fact, doing good to non-Christians may very well be our initial witness to them of the love of Christ. Before we say anything, people always worry about, you know, what am I going to say if I try and talk to people about Jesus? You don't have to say a thing. Just do good by them. Just let them see somebody actually caring about them. That's all you got to do. And the Holy Spirit can work through that. Then they want to know, why are you being nice to me? And then you'll have your opportunity to talk to them about Jesus. All right, the Lutheran problem of good works. And, you know, sad to say, this is, the devil has a way of attacking uh, attacking his truth, God's truth, uh, I I in a way uh, that kind of hits home sometimes. Uh, do Lutherans have a problem with good works? Lutherans have a perceived problem with good works. Uh, the world does think we spend so much time talking about right doctrine, uh, and yet it doesn't seem to shape our conduct like it should. And there may be something to that. You know, do we do good like we say we do? Or is our, is our faith nothing more than a bunch of words? You know, if we're talking about doing good and having faith and right doctrine and all that, and then out there are acting like everybody else around us, we are doing damage to God's word in their minds. We're undoing everything we confess with our mouth. So words and works need to follow each other. So here is an issue, actually, uh, that goes way back to the foundations of Lutheranism, and it's forming originally in the 1500s. Uh, there was a, a theological debate about good works. What place do they really hold in our lives? Uh, so let me read this little bit to you, and it also explains how we worked through this as Lutherans and what we actually do say about good works. So a disagreement has occurred among the theologians of the Augsburg Confession concerning good works. One part saying good works are necessary for salvation. They say it is impossible to be saved without good works. They say good works are required of true believers as fruits of faith, and faith without love is dead, although such love is no cause of salvation. The other part, however, contended on the contrary, that good works are indeed necessary, but not for salvation, but for other reasons. A few have gone so far as to say that good works are injurious to salvation. All right, so first, there is no controversy among our theologians concerning the following points in this article. Namely, that it is God's will, order, and command that believers should walk in good works. And that truly good works are not those which everyone contrives himself from a good intention, or which are done according to traditions of men, but those which God himself has prescribed and commanded in his word. Also, that truly good works are done not from our own natural powers, but in this way, when the person by faith is reconciled with God and renewed by the Holy Ghost, or as St. Paul says, is created anew in Christ Jesus to good works. As regards the necessity of good works, it is clear that in the Augsburg Confession and its Apology, these expressions are often repeated that good works are necessary. Likewise, that it is necessary to do good works, which are also necessarily to follow faith and reconciliation. When this word necessary is used, it should be understood not of coercion, but only of the ordinance of the immutable will of God, whose debtors we are. So, do, good, do Lutherans believe good works are necessary for salvation? Actually, yes, we do, but not to earn it. They are necessary expressions of being saved. Uh, and if we claim to be saved, and yet we're shunning the opportunities for following God's word in life, and we're following the pattern of the world, then there's a serious problem with our understanding of salvation. As regards the proposition that good works are said to be injurious to salvation, we explain ourselves clearly as follows. If, any sh if anyone should wish to drag good works into the article of justification, that means, you know, being saved, being declared righteous, or rest his righteousness or trust for salvation upon them, to merit God's grace or be saved by them, 
to this, not we say, but St. Paul himself says, and repeats it three times in Philippians, that to such a man his works are not only useless and a hindrance, but also injurious. But this is not the fault of the good works themselves, but of the false confidence placed in the works contrary to the express word of God. However, it by no means follows that we should say good works are injurious to believers with regard to their salvation. For it is God's will and express command that believers should do good works which the Holy Ghost works in believers and with which God is pleased for Christ's sake and to which he promises glorious reward in this life and the life to come. So are good works necessary? The three positions, top of page three. The three positions on good works. And when we talk about good works, again, this means obeying God, obeying his, his commands. The first one, works are necessary because they contribute to our salvation. That's the Roman Catholic view. Sadly, that is also the view of many evangelicals and non-denominationalists and those of Baptist-type theology. Not all, but many. Second position, good works are necessary but do not contribute to our salvation. That's the Lutheran view. That's what we confess. And lastly, good works are not necessary. That's the liberal view. You know, that's, that's the view of all those who claim to be Christian and yet also champion things like abortion and homosexuality and all of that. You don't have to actually follow what God's word says. Just have Jesus in your heart and you can do your own thing. But what have you noticed? When it comes down to the most important moments, this child always ends up doing the things that she was taught when she was young because she can't stand the, uh, she cannot stand the, um, it eats out of her conscience. Mm -hmm. So well, she, you good. Know, she goes through the whole scenario with her father and of course right away I tell her, you gotta do the right thing. She's like, mom, you can't do that. It's too scary. Da, 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 da. I said, well, you don't really have a choice. And, and, and then he told me, let me deal with her. I said, okay. I back up. And yeah, then, well, train a child in the way they'll go, and they won't depart from it when they get it older. Worked. And you know what? She did the right thing, and she was so relieved when she did the right thing. Good. Yeah, it is. It, is, it can be scary to do the right thing. You know, granted, it can look intimidating, but God is behind it, so we trust him. So she acts like this big liberal, but she always comes back to doing the conservative thing that she was taught as a child, when it's in the important moments. Yes. Only in the important moments. That's good. Verse 11. See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. Uh, now, if you compare that, I think that should be Galatians, is it 4 or 2.15? Is that right? Flesh reject, but you receive, yeah, yeah, I think it should be 2.15. Nope, that doesn't work either. What in the world was I thinking there? Oh, Galatians! No, I'm in Galatians. Yeah, well, anyway, someplace here in Galatians. I do that too often. Bear with. No, it is. Okay, 4.15 in Galatians. Uh, what then was, see, I was reading the wrong one. What then was the blessing you, uh, you enjoyed? For I bear witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. So you take 4.15 and you couple it with what he says here in 6.11, with which large letters I've written to you with my own hand. It certainly sounds like Paul is talking about being legally blind. Like he can't see right. Uh, and we've talked about this, you know, before in Galatians. But here it, it's coming to the front again. Paul is... Paul is drawing attention to a disability in him. He's legally blind. Uh, it's a way of giving God glory in a reverse sort of way. Because any good things that are happening certainly aren't because Paul was this great physical specimen, because he's not. Uh, there was a, there's a, a Greek historian uh, who wrote, supposedly saw Paul and gave a physical description of Paul. Paul was nothing to look at. A large Jewish hooked nose, balding and on the relatively short side. Uh, I don't know if that sounds like anybody amongst us, but, uh, and now blind on top of it. So Paul, Paul had, Paul was not winning converts because of his physical presence. 
just the opposite. Uh, people were being drawn because of his teaching alone and the work of the Holy Spirit, not because of him. So that's, again, why he, he draws attention all the time to his own weakness. It's a way of elevating God's work. Um, a second asterisk on verse 11, page 3, some have suggested that the expression, how large a letters, look how large a letters I write to you, is actually means how distinguished, uh, large in terms of their great literary capacity. Uh, so as what their, the way they interpret this verse would be, um, you know, we're talking about doing good and all of that, and you know, look at this, look at this letter that I've written to you and how literarily precise it is. You know, look, look at what a good student I am, how smart I've, I am, how studied I am, and yet, you know, I'm approaching you in a, in, a, in a humble way as brothers. I'm not elevating myself over you, even though obviously I'm much more educated than you people are. You know, that's kind of what some say he's trying to say in this. I, th I think that's an awkward way of interpreting it, and I, I don't share that interpretation. Uh, but nonetheless, that's, that's what some might suggest here. Verse 12, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these try to compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. So many desire, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh. Now, it, that, that actually verse makes more sense if you understand verse 11 in terms of him emphasizing his legal blindness. Because he's saying, look, weak in the flesh in verse 11. Then verse 12 he, says, 12 he says, yeah, but there are those who want to make a good showing in the flesh. They want to try and compel you to be circumcised. Uh, they want to look good. I don't look good, that's what you say in verse 11. Uh, but that, that's why they're doing this to you. Uh, oh, absolutely. God uses people with disabilities all the time. That's a tremendous witness. Um, first asterisk under verse 12, on the handout, Paul suggests the Judaizers in Galatia are being influenced and pressured by other Judaizers. So by championing their legalistic position, they are in good with the legalists and won't be persecuted themselves. So yeah, verse 12, he said, only they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Why are the legalists pushing this in Galatia? So they can look good. So they can take the pressure off themselves. And, and these Judaizers, remember, are Christians. They think they're Christians. They're, they're trying to push a Christian message because they're talking a lot about Jesus. The only problem is, it's Jesus plus. You know, it's Jesus plus your works. Jesus plus your keeping the law. So they, they, they don't want to look like they've given up on the Jewish religion. They just want to add Jesus into it. So the, the one group that we know existed at this point historically who would have been a problem for these Christian converts from Judaism were the Jewish zealots. That was an actual political group, the zealots. Um, which disciple? There was one of the disciples was a zealot. Who was that, Roger? <laughs> one of the disciples. One of the disciples was a zealot. So he came from the zealot sect. Um, and this this political group was these were the radicals. Uh, on the handout in the box tells you a little bit. This is, this is not a religious source. It's just Encyclopedia Britannica. But this is what the Jewish zealots were. The zealots were an aggressive political party whose concern for the national and religious life of the Jewish people led them to despise even Jews who sought peace and conciliation with Roman authorities. Uh, extremists among the zealots turned to terrorism and assassination and became known as the Sicarii. Um, or dagger men. They frequently, uh, frequented public places with hidden daggers to strike down persons friendly to Rome. In the first revolt against Rome, the zealots played a leading role. And at Masada, they committed suicide rather than surrender the fortress. 
but they were still a force to be reckoned with into the first part of the following century. A few scholars see a possible relationship between the zealots and the Jewish religious community mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the zealots were dangerous, uh, even to the point of murderous, and they were protecting the Jewish identity. Well, this they did with Rome, it mentions Encyclopedia Britannica, but they would have had the same attitude towards Christians, especially guys like Paul, because Paul was a Pharisee at one point in time. He was zealous for Jewish truth, and then he becomes a Christian and starts teaching people that the law can't save him, and that would have pushed all the buttons for the zealots. So I think these Galatian Judaizers were probably in fear of their own life from guys like this, from these Jewish zealots, so they wanted to find a compromise with Christianity and Judaism. So they could still say they're following the law and make the zealots happy and still have Jesus at the same time. So this is a good example of how you can't have it both ways. Simon the Zealot, thank you. Yes. And, and, you know, who's the only guy among the disciples to whip out a sword and cut somebody's ear off? It's, it, that, that zealousness, that, that, that even terroristic spirit is just, was just part of him. He fit in well with the zealots. Okay, uh, verse 13. Uh, Not even those who are circumcised keep the law. But they desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. And there's the real problem with legalism. Uh, legalism looks myopically at the law. That is, it sees only a few laws that it champions and keeps. It ignores the many laws it doesn't keep. It fails to see the impossibility of salvation through the law because it does not apply the full law broadly to itself. Um, you know, that's, that's true with a group like, say, Seventh-day Adventists, whose entire premise for their, their denomination, their sect, really, the entire premise is you have to worship on Saturday because it's the Old Testament law. It's the Old Testament Sabbath. You have to worship then. And if you don't worship on the Sabbath, you, that's a mark of the devil. If you worship on Sunday, you're going to hell. That's Seventh-day Adventism. Uh, but, conveniently, the Seventh-day Adventists also seem to ignore all the other Sabbath laws and all the other purity laws of the Old Testament. The Sabbath law of the Old Testament wasn't just worship on Saturday. It was, you can't even pick up sticks in your yard on, upon penalty of death. You can't do any work. You can't carry a load over 10 pounds. You can't cook you can't start a fire in your home. Your furnace goes out. You've got to freeze until the next day. You know? And, and the, the Seventh-day Adventists just conveniently dismiss all those other Sabbath laws from the Old Testament and focus myopically on, but it's got to be on Saturday. That, that's only that much of the story. And then also all the other purity laws and all the other Old Testament laws, where they just kind of conveniently dismiss all those as if the only one that matters is the Sabbath on a the, on the Saturday. Uh, that's, that's what legalism always does. It focuses myopically on just a couple of the laws it thinks it can follow right and make a show of itself and ignores all the other ones that condemn it. Church feels that way. Not about the Sabbath. That you can't do, not about the Sabbath, but that you can't work on Sunday. Um, or do anything at You know, we do, we do actually, and my ma kind of shares this to a certain extent, and there is, you know, I've got no problem with somebody wanting to show respect on Sunday and not work. You know, that's fine. It only becomes a problem when you say, if you do work on Sunday, you are sinning, and somehow or another, um, you're, you're bringing down God's judgment on you. Because the, the Sunday not working thing, we're supposed to devote ourselves to God's word and worship on Sunday. And if we do that, there's nothing in Scripture that suggests we can't do other work on Sundays along with that. Yeah, we can't, we can't, we can't, yeah, I'm working on Sundays. We can't ignore, um, we, we, can't, we can't ignore the need for worship. We need that. And 
that may mean some of our other jobs have to get put aside so we can go to church and receive. That's the, our, biggest, our biggest responsibility before God is to receive his grace. But when we meet that and when we fulfill that obligation, there's nothing wrong with going back into the fields and driving for the rest of the day or you know, working with the animals or doing whatever else you got to do. But, um, yeah, that church does have to be a priority in our lives because that's where we get grace, and you don't get that sitting in a tractor in the field. Yes? Tell her the lawnmower story. Pastor, Pastor Cleavy? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Pastor, pa former pastor before I got here. Um, had, I guess there, there were those in the community who believed that if you did any work on Sunday, you were sinning, so he purposely waited to mow his lawns till Sunday just to teach a lesson that that's not true. So sometimes, sometimes that, is, that is what we got to do. Like this morning I woke up and I could not walk, and I could not, I couldn't, I couldn't use my arms or my legs. And I, I, I talked to the Lord about it for a long time, and I'm like, God, I, I need to go and be in your house, and I need to be around other Christians, and I don't care if Chet has to take me in a wheelchair, I'm going. And yeah, good. you know what? I feel better already. And mm -hmm. I know this is where I have to come when I'm in pain, and I know I have to come to him, and I prayed to him for the whole time I was trying to get ready to come, and by the time I got here, I'm feeling, and my meds have kicked in, I feel better, I'm in the right place, I'm learning, and I don't think that there's anything more the devil would have liked if I would have said, I can't go to church today because I'm in too much pain. Right, and he'll use all kinds of excuses as to why it's okay. But, uh, yeah, right, we have to fight through them. All right, let's try and finish this up. Uh, verse 14. Oh, I am in Ephesians. All of a sudden, there we are. Verse 14. Uh, but God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Uh, so the cross of Jesus. This can be slang for our suffering for faith. If we bear the cross... Uh, or slang for the suffering of Jesus that saves us. Both senses are employed here. So Paul, uh, that I should glory except in the cross. Uh, you, you could understand that both in terms of Paul saying my sufferings, I shouldn't glory except in my sufferings for Jesus. Or he could very well be saying I shouldn't glory except when I look to, this, to the sufferings of, of Jesus. But they're both intertwined. Uh, the point is, Paul's view of salvation is outward. He looks to Christ. He boasts in Jesus' saving work. Legalists' views are always inward, boasting in some human accomplishment. So Paul's saying, yeah, I don't boast except in, in Jesus, in the cross of Jesus, not in myself, in whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Well, that's a strange expression. Um, in the box, this is a quote from Luther. Uh, this is a characteristically Pauline expression. The world has been crucified to me. That is, I regard the world as condemned. And I have been crucified to the world. That is, the world regards me as condemned in turn. Thus, we crucify and condemn each other. I curse all the righteousness, the doctrine, and the works of the world as a venom of the devil. The world in turn curses my doctrine and my deeds and judges me to be a dangerous man, a heretic, a seditionist, etc. So today, the world has been crucified to us and we to the world. Other ways to understand this. Uh, the world as short for the philosophy of the world, the goals, direction, the guiding principles of the world. Uh, the basic worldly assumption that the law saves. So Jesus has freed us from the world from the world's philosophies, which are dead to us. So I've been crucified to the world, meaning, and the world crucified to me, uh, meaning we are separated from the world. The world is dead to us. We have a new life in Christ. And all the old ways of thinking that drove the world are dead to us. We have a new mind and a new heart. Verse 15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Paul could have just said this verse and kind of 
done away with all the rest of this because really this is the heart of everything he's been driving at for the past six chapters. Uh, it's, everything else he said is all related to this. This was the main issue facing the Galatians. Circumcision or uncircumcision avails nothing. None of that matters. What does matter is the new creation. That is, that's what the gospel does. Create something new in us, not laws. Uh, so the first asterisk under where it says verse 15. Creation in, in Greek terms, fuller meaning, uh, creation ex nihilo. Th this is significant, even though it's subtled. What matters is a new creation. The word for creation in English just means create something. The word, this particular word in Greek, though, means creation from nothing. So what matters is this new creation from nothing. That's faith. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't build on what we offer, like the Judaizers teach. He creates from nothing. Uh, we have eternal life not because of anything we brought to God, but God created something out of nothing. That's the beauty of it. Uh, here is a quote from Luther again in box bottom of page four. Therefore, a new creation is a renewal of the mind by the Holy Spirit. This is then followed by an outward change in the flesh, in the parts of the body, and in the senses. For when the heart acquires new light, a new judgment, and new motivation through the gospel, it also brings about a renewal of the senses. The ears long to hear the word of God instead of listening any longer to human traditions and notions. The lips and tongue do not boast of their own works, righteousness, and monastic rules, but joyfully they proclaim nothing but the mercy of God disclosed in Christ. These changes are, so to speak, not verbal, they are real. They produce a new mind and a new will, new senses, and even new actions by the flesh, so that the eyes, the ears, the lips, and the tongue not only see, hear, and speak otherwise than they used to, but the mind itself evaluates things and acts upon them differently from the way it did before. Formerly, it went about blindly in the airs and darkness of the Pope, imagining that God is a peddler who sells his grace to us in exchange for our works and merits. Now that the light of the gospel has risen, it knows that it acquires righteousness solely by faith in Christ. Therefore, it now casts off its self-chosen works and performs instead the works of the calling and the works of love which God has commanded. So, uh, a new creation, yes. Or circumcision or uncircumcision, it's not what it's about. It's about new creation. We are new creations. Verse 16, as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Uh, rule is another wor word, I think, that's not a good translation. Rule, rule can mean many things. A rule could be a, a, a rule you have to follow, like a command. Or a rule can be like a yardstick or a, you know, a measuring line. That's, that's the word in Greek being used here. It's a measuring line, not the command. So as many as walk according to this new measure would be a better translation of it. So it's not that he's, Paul's giving you new rules to follow. This is just a whole new measurement of how you look at your life. So for those who get that and get the gospel, have received Christ, understand his grace and their place in it, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. That's what makes us Israel. Verse 17 and 18 to close. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Let nobody bother me anymore. Kind of an abrupt ending. You know, don't, don't bug me with this stuff anymore. But it's more than that. It's, I bear in my, mark, in my body the marks of Jesus. It's like, I've suffered for this. Um, you know, I've, I've endured everything I, I should have to endure for this. You want proof? You want proof of Christ's working? Uh, look, at, look at me and what's happened to me. Here's a, a quote from Das that kind of explains this. 
Uh, Cicero, the great first century BC orator, describes a speech by Marcus Antonius, the grandfather of Mark Antony, in defense of Manius Aquilus, a former, con a former consul and retired general who was accused of extortion. At a dramatic and tearful moment in the speech, Marcus Antonius tore open the sorrowful, dejected Manius Aquilus garment to expose his scars from battle, proof of his dedication and loyalty to Rome. The rival should not trouble Paul because he bears the marks of Jesus in his body. He has proven his loyalty to the gospel by the scars he bears. Uh, and, and I think with Paul, it's not just scars under his clothes. I think his whole face and head was scarred up because he, he was knocked out several times by people stoning him to death. The only way you get knocked out is if you're getting a hit in the head with rocks. So he undoubtedly had scars all over from where people had been beating on him because of his proclamation of Jesus. He, he would have been an interesting guy to, to visually see. Uh, but, you know, those scars carry weight. Uh, Paul's loyalty, dedication to Christ and the gospel cannot be questioned. Uh, in English, yeah, this is another a subtle thing again, but I think noteworthy. In English, verse 18 starts with the word brethren. In the Greek, verse 18 ends with the word brethren. If you put the brethren, if you move it from the beginning of the sentence to the end of the sentence, it, it has a little more power. It's like the last word out of Paul's mouth before he says amen is brethren. So he's, he's like reinforcing the fact that I may have been pretty harsh on you people. You know, this, this got kind of intense. I wasn't always nice about this, but I was always truthful. But the last word out of his mouth is, you're still my brothers. We're still brothers in this. So the, the, the subtle little change in word order, I think, carries a stronger sense of Paul still showing them love and kindness. Brothers, amen. You know. All right. Any thoughts, any comments or questions about Galatians? Well, he might have to be firm, but he's always still love. He never leaves us. Exactly. Love is still the primary thing behind all of it. Absolutely. All right. Let's close with prayer. Gracious Father, we pray for your grace this day once more to secure us in your gospel and keep us from the false teachings in the world around us. Build us up in right faith, in right confession, and mold our lives around your word that we may confess you in all we say and do. For Jesus' sake, amen.